<laughs> oh, good morning, good morning, good morning. Today is Thursday, December 29th, 2023, 2022, and we're just two days away from the end of the year. So there's today and tomorrow, tax loss harvesting, lots of kind of action like that going on. And where is Santa? I guess the Grinch, in fact, came in and stole Christmas. But let's just move on and think about it. It has been a tough year for sure. So, uh, I am Kenny Polkari, your host of the party, and here is what you need to know for uh, today and tomorrow and then into the new year. Yes, 2022 was a tough year. The Grinch did come in and steal the Santa rally. Investors now doing lots of tax loss harvesting and reallocating the sectors that they think are going to do better next year. It makes perfect sense. It happens every year, right? The headlines are all negative, and so therefore the path of least resistance is lower. And will COVID strike again as a new surge reveals itself in China? And that's becoming a big concern. So what are we having for dinner? Well, it's a, it's a holiday drink and it's called Coquito and we'll get there in a minute. So the headlines keep coming and the algos keep sending wave after wave of sell orders to the market because during this anxious time, the path of least resistance is lower. It's always lower when the news is unclear. But what's really curious is that lots of the headlines are not about central bank policy, sticky inflation, collapsing home prices, or rising rates. Most of what we're hearing now is about a resurgence of a new strain of COVID-19. Coming from where? Yes, coming from China once again as they reopen uh, their markets and their, and their country, and we see a surge of a new variant, right? So the headlines say, COVID surge in China prompts U.S. to require travel testing. Tesla stock suffers December sell-off amid demand concerns against a China production pause. European stocks fall as COVID-19 angst spreads. And then we have these other assorted headlines which aren't adding uh, anything to the equation, right? Wall Street bankers brace for big pay cuts, but bosses don't want whining. Well, let me just tell you something. Goldman Sachs is cutting bonuses by 40%, and trust me, Davy Solomon, the CEO, is going to hear plenty of whining from the Goldman guys. And J.P. Morgan and Bank of America and Jeffrey Zamogas still here also believe to be cutting bonuses by 30%. And there's going to be plenty of whining there as well, right? Because that's what they do. Big investment bankers, they whine when it doesn't go their way. Anyway, and then how Southwest melted down, right? That stock lost 5% yesterday after we saw this massive meltdown over, the, uh, over this past week. And crypto customers sell claims at a loss to avoid a bankruptcy wait, while FTX diverted $200 million of customer money for two venture deals that caught the SEC's attention, of which I have to ask, when did it catch their attention? Because it didn't catch your attention before FT to FTX collapsed, so it's interesting on when and who was watching, right? And so what this says is that investors are exhausted and the algos don't know what to do, right? It's not a statement that the buyers have gone away because quite the contrary, the buyers are alive and well. They have not gone away. They just don't need to be as aggressive, right? The buyers are in control at the moment because the sellers need the buyers to engage. But if the buyers see no reason to take stock, they also don't see a reason to just stand there and get run over, then they're going to let the sellers panic a little bit and push prices lower, which is exactly what's happening, right? As the market's down day after day, the sellers are panicking. Where are the buyers, right? By the time the closing bell rang on Wednesday, stock prices were lower once again. The Dow lost 365 points or 1.1%. The S&P gave up 46 points or 1.2%. The NASDAQ lowered by 140 points or 1.3%. The Russell lost 28 points or 1.6, and the transports gave up a whopping 231 points, or 1.7%. And all this reveals is that investors are just exhausted, right? They're here, but they're tired, so they're sitting back. Look, at look. it's been a long year. Stocks have suffered, and the news has not been good. And so why would you expect the buyers to be aggressive, especially now? On top of all the negative headlines concerning a range of issues, we're still dealing with the weakening U.S. macro data and aggressive Fed and an equally aggressive European central banks and other central banks around the world. We have rising interest rates, and that does two things, right? It puts pressure on stocks, especially the sexy high growth ones get hurt the worst. NASDAQ down 35% year to date. While it also offers investors an alternative. See, three-month T-bills are now yielding 4.3%. 
They offer zero risk while keeping you completely liquid. You roll them every three months. Two-year treasuries are now yielding 4.35%, but you have to hold those for a bit longer. But it's all better than losing money in the market if you don't have the time or the stamina to take advantage of what is surely going to be known as a long-term buying opportunity. Buyers in the market now are saying that they don't know where the bottom is. They never really do, but they're happy to kind of feather new money into the market, right? What you call dollar cost averaging. Taking advantage of the sale going on, especially in the good, high quality, mega cap, multinational names. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a sale going on in a bunch of the other names as well, but they're not the big mega cap, you know, names that we're talking about, right? You just have to decide uh, what sector you really want to be in if you're concerned about market action, right? What's going to give you the most protection? Calls for S&P to test 3,000 by Goldman and Morgan before this is over represents an 18% decline from here. Fourth quarter earnings revisions are now lower and they continue to go lower. And that's happening on a daily occurrence ahead of the start of earnings season just two weeks away. S&P 2023 year-end earnings per share are also getting slashed and burned from what was expected to be $230 a share to anywhere between $180 to $200 a share for 2023. Now, none of this is new, by the way. This has been the narrative for months. So anyone who's going to point to these arguments as the reason for this recent weakness is missing the boat. The fear now is that the narrative is wrong or that investors are just shuffling the deck selling the losers, of which there are many, and it makes sense, and repositioning themselves for the new year. Just to be clear, I'm in the camp that we could test the October low of 34.70 before we find a bottom, which represents another 8% move down from here, if, if the tone doesn't change at all. Now, if we get a renewed surge of COVID, a black swan type of event, then all bets are off, right? Because you're going to have to re-examine what happens at that point. I don't think it's going to happen, but I suppose it's always out there and it could. But let's not kid ourselves. It is ugly right now, right? But there are some sectors that have been holding up. You just have to look for them. Every sector yesterday was lower. Energy leading the way down 2.2%. But that's still up 55% year to date. Now, it was down yesterday on these renewed COVID fears. And what it could do to the energy demand story. Tech, XLK, down 1.6%. Leaving that sector down 31%. Real estate down 1.6. That sector's off 30% year to date. Communications down 1.5. That's off 40% year to date. Basic materials, XLB down 1.5%, leaving that off 15%. Industrials down 1.3. That's off 8%. Consumer staples are down 1.2, but that's only off 3% year to date, while consumer discretionary is down 30%. Healthcare gave up 6 tenths of a percent, but that's down 4% in a year. Financials are down 14% on the year, while utilities lost 1%, and they're down just 1% on the year. Housing, XHB, is down 13% year-to-date. Uh, retail, XRT, is down 35 Semis, down 38 Metals and mining, they were off 4% yesterday, but they're still up 10% on the year. Aerospace and defense was down 7 tenths, but that's up 8.5% on the year. The value trade off 8%, while the growth trade is down 32%. On the Cogger side, it's a different story. The basic retail hedges are all up and up significantly. Dog is up 1.1% yesterday, so it's up 6% on the year. The SH, which is up 1.2% yesterday, is up 20% on the year. And the PSQ gained 1.4% yesterday, and it's up 40% on the year. Treasury yields are on the rise, and they remain inverted and getting more so. Oil was traded back up to $80 ahead of the severe winter weather we got last week. Is now trading back at 77 and a half on those renewed COVID fears and what it will do to demand. I think it's baloney, but whatever. Gold is trading right at the trend line, 1812, uh, holding on to that as it continues to churn between 1750 and 1820. This morning, U.S. futures are churning a bit higher as we enter the final two trading days of the year. The Dow's up 44 points, S&P was up 12, the Nasdaq 65, the Russell was adding six points all at six o'clock this morning. There is no eco data to speak of that's going to do anything to determine the path of stocks today. All of the action will be driven by the year-end tax loss selling and investors looking to take advantage of good quality names ahead of the new year as they reposition themselves in sectors that they think are going to hold up better. Now, here's the thought. Unlike stocks, that if you sell them to do tax loss harvesting to take advantage of that loss, and then you cannot replace that same position for 30 days without negating that sale, cryptos do not fall under that rule. Why? Because they're not securities. So you can make a sale today, you can take the loss and immediately turn around and buy that position again, 
to maintain your exposure. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you the facts and that you can do it. So if you want to ring in a loss and then reestablish a position, you can do it all on the same trading day. European markets are all high this morning. Well, not much higher, but they're all up about four tenths of a percent across the board as we enter the final two trading days of the year. Again, nothing there is going to significantly drive the action. The S&P closed yesterday at 3783, down 46 points after testing as low as 3780. It kind of feels like it wants to hold here and attempt to rally in the final two days of the year. But no matter what the rally is, it isn't going to save the day at all. Just saying this year, I guess the Grinch did come in and steal Christmas. Okay. So what do we have? And this is not, this is not a, 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 a meal. This is a drink that you serve around the holiday season. It's a it's a Puerto Rican drink, comes from my wife's side of the family. It's called Coquito, which means little coconut. And it is a traditional Puerto Rican Christmas music. drink. It's kind of like eggnog without the eggs. Although I do understand some people do put eggs in it. We do not. My wife does not. It's a great drink to serve to your guests on New Year's Eve when the ball drops. It's not a drink you're going to drink all night. It's a drink that you would drink to celebrate like that event. So for this, you need dark rum. Like Flo de Gagne works great for this. You need one can of a cream of coconut, like a Coco Lopez can of coconut. You need one 12-ounce can of evaporated milk, one 14-ounce can of condensed milk, one and a half teaspoons of vanilla extract, and you need a cinnamon stick, right? Now, that's per, per, um, per mix, right? Now, in a blender, you add the one and a half cups of rum. You can, all, you can taste it and always add more, but don't add too much because you'll overdo it. You add the whole can of cream of coconut, the evaporated milk, the condensed milk. Add in the vanilla and blend it at high speed. Then take it off the blender, toss in the cinnamon stick. Don't blend the cinnamon stick and put it in the refrigerator for at least an hour, right? We typically make it a day or two days before we let it sit in the refrigerator uh, with the cinnamon stick in there. We put them in glass bottles and seal them and they just sit there. And then when you're ready to use them, shake them really well, just so you mix it all up again and then pour it out into glasses. You know, you're not going to have a big, tall glass full. You're going to have like a taste, right? And you're going to pass it around. We do this at Christmas. We do it on Christmas Eve. We do it Christmas Day. We do it all the weekend between Christmas and New Year's. And we do it on New Year's, right? And then, it's, and then it goes away. Uh, it's one of those holiday drinks. It goes away until Christmas again next year. In any event, I hope you like it. And it's called Coquito is how you pronounce it. And those are the directions. And in my house, you know, we'll make, we'll make a dozen bottles of this uh, because everyone enjoys it. And then we have it for the week uh, in between. We have it for Christmas and then right up until New Year's. And if we run out, guess what? We make some more. In any event, look, the sun's coming out. After the cold spell we had here, it's going to be about 75, 80 degrees today, and it's going to get warmer again as we move into the weekend. I'm hoping to get out and get to the beach a little bit today uh, after I appear on Fox Business with Charles Payne at 2 p.m. Be sure to tune in. In any event, until tomorrow, take good care.